And this is VOA One, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel, Dorothy Gundy, Anna Mateo, and Katie Weaver. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Dan Friedel. The main library at Mosul University in Iraq opened in 1921 after a donation from 60 of the city's libraries in 1967 its collection grew to nearly 1 million books the library had books on subjects such as literature science philosophy law culture and contained old maps writings, and newspapers. Over time, it became the university's research center, and 1,500 students would visit each day. But that changed when the Islamic State took over Mosul in June 2014. The militant group forced its way into the library and started breaking equipment and burning books. In early 2015, IS loaded about 8,000 books onto trucks, took them outside of the city, and set them on fire. The Director General of UNESCO, the United Nations Cultural Organization, called this a cleansing and a systematic destruction of heritage. While many books were destroyed, the building itself remained largely undamaged until a nine-month-long battle started in late 2016. By the time the Iraqi military pushed IS from Mosul, thousands of people had died. Many people fled the fighting and thousands of buildings were destroyed, including the library. It was burned by IS and hit by missiles aimed at ousting the group. Tahani Saleh was an economics student at the university in 2014. When the fighting started, she stayed home for almost 1,000 days. She is now 28 and working to rebuild the library. She remembers seeing thick black smoke coming from the building. She said the fire looked mad and she could see the smoke, although her home is a long way from the library. Muhammad Jassim al Hamdani used to oversee the library. He said he saw pictures of the destroyed building on television. At the time, he left Mosul to get away from the fighting. He said he did not think the library would survive the damage, so he started a new library for students at Kirkuk University. After the fighting ended, Almost 95% of Mosul University's library collection was lost. Al-Hamdani said many of the items can never be replaced. In January 2017, Iraqi forces retook the part of Mosul that includes the university. Saleh thought she might be able to go back to school. But without the library, she wondered, where would she study? My university was destroyed, she said. 
while she could not stop the destruction that happened years earlier, she realized she could work to rebuild the library. She got help from her friend, Omar Mohammed. He ran a blog called Mosul I. The two worked to call attention to the destroyed library and used Twitter to ask people to help. Mohammed tweeted, Our central library is liberated but burned to ashes. Are you willing to donate books to it? After some time passed, Saleh went to the library with some friends. It was dark, cold, and dangerous. They were worried about mines and unexploded devices that might go off. Once inside, she and her friends discovered an area that held old newspapers. They had survived. Muhammad wrote about Saleh's discovery on his blog. He asked people to come help recover the books and newspapers from the library and bring them to a safe place. About 20 people came and worked in the hot weather for 40 days. They moved about 32,000 books in that time. It was hard work and dangerous. One day, the Iraqi military told the volunteers to leave. They thought IS might target them. Saleh said, About ten minutes after they left the area, three rockets landed nearby. It was loud. People were worried but they still came back the next day to save the books. Over time, more and more people brought books to the library. Now there are about 60,000. They are on shelves at the university's education college. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. In 2020, many people in the United States found an escape by going out into nature and open places. Hiking trails, parks, and other outdoor spaces were very busy with people searching for fresh air during coronavirus health crisis restrictions. People who were staying at home and whose gyms were closed took their exercise to the great outdoors. Sports such as hiking, biking, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, camping, tennis, and golf all became more popular. In 2021, that seems to be continuing. People are still finding ways to play outdoors within coronavirus restrictions and stay-at-home guidelines. The Outdoor Foundation is part of the Outdoor Industry Association, a trade group. It released numbers comparing Americans' outdoor activities in 2019 and 2020. The group said 8.1 million more Americans went hiking. 7.9 million more went camping. And 3.4 million more people went freshwater fishing in 2020 than in the year before. In 2020, the Foundation's research also found a 52.9% increase in outdoor activity for most age groups and all income levels. 
It's both heartening and a little bit mind-blowing to think how things are going this year, said Richard Hodges. He is the director at White Pine Touring in Park City, Utah. Cross-country skiing has become much more popular. It is skiing that is done over the countryside instead of down a mountain. Every single day of the week is like a weekend day, said Hodges. The park in Utah where he works has about 20 kilometers of paths. He said there seems to be a limitless interest right now in cross-country skiing. It's been really fun, a lot of work, but really fun. All we're doing is trying to get people outside to go play in the snow. The popularity of some outdoor sports comes as no surprise to Sandra Mara. She is the president and business chief of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. It is a nonprofit organization that helps keep up the Appalachian Trail in the eastern United States. More hikers have been walking along the Appalachian Trail since the beginning of the health crisis. The trail is about 3,540 kilometers long and goes through 14 states. It gets more than 3 million visitors each year. Mara told the Associated Press that many people who never really exercised outdoors found easy-to-use trails and spaces near their homes. However, she warns people not to do too much. We're finding a lot of people are out there not prepared for just how rugged this trail is. It's not a walk on the bike trail in the middle of the city, she said. She also warns to be careful when going out for a long nature walk. She suggests hikers study weather reports and information about wildlife in the area. They should wear the right clothes for the right weather, and they should also bring supplies and maps. Golf remains popular as well. The U.S. National Golf Foundation said that Americans played almost 502 million rounds of golf in 2020. The number of golfers in the U.S. increased by half a million in 2020 to 24.8 million, the group found. The sport also grew around the world. Golf Australia said golfing has increased up to 15% since the restrictions went into effect. Already popular in Sweden, the number of golf rounds played increased 42%. And Golf Olivar de la Hinojosa in Spain had an increase of 30%. Ana Fernandez de Diego is a Spanish professional golfer and teaches the sport. She said the level of growth in the sport has not been seen before. Golf is one of the things that people can do without any risks now, she said. Tennis is also more popular. The United States Tennis Association, or USTA, said that in 2020 there were nearly 3 million first-time players. In all, more than 21.6 million Americans played the game on tennis courts last year. Mike Douse is chief of the USTA. He said on its website that many people see tennis as the ideal social distancing sport. From hiking to tennis and golf to cold weather sports, businesses are happy to see the outdoor exercising activities get more popular. Mara 
of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy also sees it as a great thing for the environment. With more people using the outdoors, it may be more likely they will take care of it. This is the new future for us, she said, the new reality. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Anna Mateo. And I'm Katie Weaver. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. Today we tell about the administration of the 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. It is January 20th, 1977, Inauguration Day. America's newly elected president, Jimmy Carter, is on his way to the White House after his swearing-in ceremony at the Capitol building. But the new president is not riding in a car. He is walking. His wife, Rosalind, and his daughter, Amy, walk with him. Crowds along Pennsylvania Avenue cheer. Bands play. On this cold day in Washington, Americans look to the future. Watergate, the crisis that led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon, is several years in the past. The Vietnam War is history, too. Republican Gerald Ford served the remaining years of Nixon's term. Many people believe he brought respect and order back to the government. Yet he lost the office to Democrat Jimmy Carter in the election of 1976. The nation still has problems. Unemployment is high. So is inflation. But the future of the nation looks bright. Jimmy Carter feels sure about his future, too. On the day before his inauguration, he said, I do feel that the uh, people of this nation and I think the entire world wish me well and want to see me succeed as president. And that gives me a sense of reassurance and confidence. I think I'm ready now to be president. During the election campaign, Carter often said he would be different from other presidents. He told voters he was not a member of the Washington political establishment so he would do things in his own independent way. Carter was from Georgia, in the deep south of the United States. There had not been a president born in the south in more than 100 years. Carter studied nuclear engineering and attended the United States Naval Academy. He planned to stay in the Navy. Then his father died, and he decided to return to Georgia to operate the family peanut farm. Carter began his political life on the committee that supervised schools in his hometown of Plains, Georgia. He also served in other local offices. In 1966, he failed to win the Democratic nomination for governor of Georgia. For the next four years, he traveled around the state gathering support. He won the next election. As governor, Carter earned praise for reorganizing the state government. He also reformed state programs dealing with prisons and mental health care. In 1972, he offered himself as a candidate for vice president with presidential candidate George McGovern, but the Democratic Party chose someone else. Carter did not wait long to begin his next political move.
he would try to win the Democratic presidential nomination in 1976. Jimmy Carter was hardly known outside the state of Georgia. Political experts gave him little chance. Even his mother was surprised to learn that he wanted to be president. President of what, she asked. But the farmer and former governor had a plan. He would try to win his party's primary elections in the South. He believed this would give him enough support at the party convention to win the nomination. Other Democratic candidates tried to stop him, but his plan worked. By the time of the convention, he had enough support to win the nomination on the first ballot. In the general election, Carter defeated President Ford by almost 2% of the popular vote. He lost in the West and Middle West, but won the South and Northeast. President Carter believed strongly in human rights. He hoped he could use his new position to support human rights throughout the world. On this and other issues, he was not afraid of being criticized when he believed he was right. For example, he believed it was right for the United States to end its control of the Panama Canal. He won congressional support for treaties to give control to Panama by the year 2000. He believed it was right to give diplomatic recognition to communist China. And he believed it was right to continue negotiations with the Soviet Union about limiting nuclear weapons, even though he denounced human rights violations there. In 1979, Carter and Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev signed the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, known as SALT II. However, Carter decided not to send the treaty to the Senate for approval after the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan later that year. One of the finest moments of Carter's presidency took place at Camp David. That is the holiday home of American presidents. There, in March 1979, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt met with Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel. They signed a peace treaty, ending 30 years of war between their countries. We are privileged to witness tonight a significant achievement in the cause of peace, an achievement none thought possible a year ago or even a month ago, an achievement that reflects the courage and wisdom of these two leaders. Both men said the treaty would not have been possible without President Carter's help. President Carter was not as successful in dealing with the economy. High unemployment and inflation continued. The federal deficit increased, although he had promised to end it. And there was a shortage of gasoline. The shortage resulted when oil-producing countries limited production and exports. Carter urged American companies to develop new sources of energy in addition to oil. He said the United States needed to do this because it could not always depend on getting enough oil from other countries. This intolerable dependence on foreign oil threatens our economic independence and the very security of our nation. The energy crisis is real. It is worldwide. It is a clear and present danger to our nation. These are facts, and we simply must face them. 
I am tonight setting a clear goal for the energy policy of the United States. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977. Never. From now on, every new addition to our demand for energy will be met from our own production and our own conservation. The generation-long growth in our dependence on foreign oil will be stopped dead in its tracks right now. During the gasoline shortage, Americans had to wait in long lines to buy fuel. They did not like it and were angry. Many were even more angry about a different situation. Like the gasoline shortage, it was a result of actions in another distant place. Good evening. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. The Americans inside have been taken prisoner. On November 4th, 1979, Muslim extremists in Iran seized the American embassy in Tehran. They took many hostages, including more than 60 Americans. The extremists said they were punishing the United States for being friendly with ousted Iranian leader Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The extremists refused to negotiate. They refused to release the hostages. In early April 1980, President Carter broke off diplomatic relations with Iran. He then ordered American military forces to try to rescue the hostages in Tehran. The operation failed. A sandstorm caused two of the aircraft to crash into each other. They went down in the desert hundreds of kilometers away. The failed rescue attempt had a major effect on the presidency of Jimmy Carter. Many Americans felt it showed that he could not do the job. Their respect for him continued to decrease as the hostages continued to be held. Other things were beginning to go wrong, too. The president's younger brother, Billy, admitted receiving a large amount of money from Libya. He took the money in exchange for supporting Libyan interests with American lawmakers. His mistake was that he did not list his name as a representative of a foreign government. Nineteen eighty was a presidential election year in the United States. President Carter was expected to be the candidate of the Democratic Party, but his chances were almost ruined because of the situation in Iran. Carter hoped that concern for the hostages would unite the country behind him. Instead, support turned to blame. Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts believed he could defeat Carter for the nomination. Kennedy won several important Democratic primary elections. But that was not enough. The party renominated Carter. Kennedy offered Carter his support, but not very strongly. This left the party divided. The Republicans got ready to win back the White House. They hoped to do it with a strong appeal to American voters. The appeal came from a man who would become one of America's most popular presidents, Ronald Reagan. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.